Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life Church. My name is Grant. I'm one of the pastors here at New Life. And I, I think today is one of those days where you can almost say summer is officially, is it done? Is summer, th- no? I mean, I walk outside, 59 degrees? You're like, all right, it's, it's fall. It's fall, which is exciting for me because now football season is here, right? Absolutely. Go Bears. Yes, go Bears. Boo? Was that a boo that I heard? I think so. I think so. Well, hey, if I've never met you before, I would love to get to know you. I'd love to get to, to know how you found out about New Life. So make sure you come talk to me after service. Uh, a great way for, we actually had someone ask this last week of, hey, how do I fill out my information? Uh, I talk about this a lot, but it's, it's the connection card online. We've, we've gone away with, with passing out the connection card. So if you want to head to the website, fill out a connection card, let us know you're here. Let us know how we can be praying for you. We have a group of individuals such as myself and the pastors on staff and elders and just our team that we specifically pray for the prayer requests that, that you have. And if you have a need right now, let us know. I think the best way for us to know that is for you to actually tell us. Don't assume that we just know these things. We, we need to hear from you. Okay, so head to our website, fill out that connection card, let us know you're here this morning. Well, so many things coming up in the fall. Awana registration is open now, and that actually family night starts September 7th. If you're interested also in one thing that I love is student ministries, right? That starts September 14th. And so if you're interested in helping out in student ministries, come talk to me. Okay, I would love to have you a part of student ministries. Maybe, maybe I would love to have you a part of student ministries. I want you to actually have the desire to do that and be there. So if you're actually interested in doing that, come talk to me as well. And then we have Bible studies, women's Bible studies starting up this fall as well here in September. We have so many things coming up that we want you to be a part of because we need it. We need to be connecting in community. We need to know each other. We need to be praying for each other and encouraging one another as we go through this journey together. So pray with me as we get started this morning. Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you are a God who loves us. God, you are in the details with everything, everything going on in our world and our culture, God. You are still in the middle and nothing is outside of your sovereign plan. And so God, I just ask right now for anyone who's here that needs to know you for the first time, God, that you'll speak to them, that needs to know your love and your grace, God, that you'll show that to them. And so we lift you up this morning and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome. It's great to see everybody. Would you please stand as we begin our time with singing and worship today? God is a great God. He is a holy God. And he deserves our praise. And so we're going to lift up a holy roar this morning. Lord, we ask that you open up the heavens today. Lord, may we see your glory. Lord, may you move us on this stage. Move us aside. Lord, you take the center stage. Lord, you are the honored guest in this place today. We lift you up. We celebrate you. We praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. We waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with you. You're the reason we're here. Yes, you're the reason we sing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the We're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our We want to see you, Lord. You're the reason. Yes, you are. You're the reason we sing. Here we go. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. The mighty river. Rolling from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. We celebrate you, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. The mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Show us you, Lord. Show us. Show us. 
Let this be our prayer today. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Lord, show us your glory today. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to an account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Peter and John were being told to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Why? There was great power when we speak the name of Jesus. Satan knows that if he can keep the church from preaching and teaching Jesus, then the church is powerless and lifeless. The church simply becomes a self-help, feel-good charity whose deeds will die the moment each person slips into eternity. There is great power in the name of Jesus. We pray to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the Savior of the world the Savior of our souls. Salvation is in Him and Him alone. The name of Jesus is beautiful, wonderful, and powerful. It's very interesting to note at the end of the passage, we read that when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, that these men had been with Jesus. They could see in these men's lives and how they spoke that they had been with Jesus. Do our lives show proof that we have been with Jesus? Does the world see that we are different, set apart for a holy God? Or do we blend it to the world? Lord Jesus, draw our hearts to you this morning. Let us greatly desire to spend time with you every day in your word, in prayer, and in worship. May we become like Peter and John, that when the world sees us, they know that we have spent time in your presence. May we seek his face this morning, the face of Jesus. Let's continue singing.
pastor here at New Life, and if you've joined us for the very first time this morning, you've joined us on Communion Sunday, and we sang that song as a lead up to this moment because what we get to do today is remember this man named Jesus, 
Before he left this earth, he gave us a way to do that. He said, here is the opportunity to remember me every time you do something. And that's something they were going to do was to eat together. Every time you eat together, remember me. Which we do this once a month. On the second Sunday of the month, we come together as communion. But we should be doing it regularly. Every day that we eat, which is pretty much every day that we live, we should remember what God has done through his son, Jesus. I was reminded the importance and power of communing this week. Many of you, if you backtrack to November of last year, you'll remember that in this very space we had an event. An event with this organization called Life Rice, where we filled boxes and food to send to Lebanon with one of our REACH partners, Tara. Well, guess what? Tara just received that package two days ago. In fact, here's a video of them unloading the truck with those boxes. 427 boxes were filled with 92,000 meals that are now in Lebanon, going to be distributed this week. Ten months later, they finally made it. And our prayer is that Tara and her team there in Lebanon will use that food to share the message of Jesus Christ. And when they sit down for a meal, they will understand the power of who he is. And so as we sit down with this today, we remember the power of Jesus and his ability to change lives. And so if you haven't grabbed one of these, I encourage you to do so. And then I want you to hold on to it and think about the fact that there is a redeemer. There is a savior and his name is Jesus. And today we remember him through communion, but every day through things as simple as sitting down for a meal, we need to remember who he is. So as you guys hold on to this for now, we're going to sing a part of the song, There is a Redeemer, and then we'll take this together. simple act of communing together, of having a meal, of eating together, that Jesus said, every time you do this, remember me. This the night before he went to the cross, he was with his disciples. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He then took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Each time you drink, do so in remembrance of me.
Jesus, we come before you today and we remember who you are. Thankful for your powerful name, that there is no, under, no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, nor by which we can be saved. So we thank you that you've given us the simple act of a meal, of communing together to remember you. And so I pray, not just today, but every day, as we sit down together in communion, that we will remember what it is that you've done, that we do it here specifically on Sunday, so we will remember it wherever it is that we go. Because of who you are and what you've done, we have the opportunity for eternal life, and we are so grateful and thankful for that, that you are our Redeemer. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to this earth to die for us and that we have the freedom today to remember what it is that he has done. Nothing that we could do but his love for us. And so I pray, Lord, that we will take that with us from this space and that we remember you every single day. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you guys stand with me as we finish singing the song? forward to that day when we step into glory and we see the fullness of who you are and we understand the fullness of what you did. Lord, help us to catch a glimpse of glory today and that we can take that into the world and we can shine the light of Jesus in a dark place. In Jesus' name. So we love doing updates when our reach partners are with us. Mike and Sandy happen to be in town this week. Are you guys in this space? Are you in the room? Can you stand up, please, in the back? Where are you? If you have a chance today, talk to them. Mike has a few stories, if you didn't notice. And he'd love to share them with you. And Sandy will tug on his arm and say, okay, let's go. Uh, but they've been around since 1978, a part of New Life, which when he said that when we were meeting, I was like, huh, I was born in 1981. That's been a little while. <laughs> and yet he looks about as old as me, and he's still going strong. 
And so thank you guys for what you do. On that note, kiddos, go ahead and head on out. Ages three through fifth grade, you are free to go. I love the opportunity for us to see our kids take off. We have them in here with us all the way through worship. And then they go on to where they get to learn about Jesus within their specific age groups. But we do it on purpose because we want to be a community. We want our kids to see mom and dad worship together and see what it means to be the church together. And so I want to welcome you here again this morning. My name is Brett. If you walked in a little bit late this morning, I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. And we're in a series called Transformed. We're going through the summer And this series is about over, which means summer is about over. Whether you want to realize it or not, Labor Day weekend is only a couple weekends away. And so as we think about what has transpired over the last number of months, hopefully you've had a good summer. Hopefully you've had a good amount of time to relax and to get out and experience things. I've had a really great summer. I've spent a lot of time with my kids. We had a chance to go on a family vacation. And so I've been out and about quite a bit. And one of the things that I've realized in my escapades this summer is that I've become the target market for people who want my money. I was in the store the other day, and I'm kind of dancing down the aisle, you know, my wife's embarrassed, I'm singing the song, and all of a sudden I realized, this song is like from my era, which subliminally made me feel much more comfortable in that store, and all of a sudden I was like, I think I need to stay here longer and spend more money. And then I realized that every sporting event I've been to the last couple years, or as I watch sporting events on TV, all the commercials have songs that are geared towards me. Have you noticed that? And they have things that I connect with because if you're in your 40s or your 50s, you are the target market. Those advertisers, the companies in our world today, want your money because you have teenagers or preteens or 20-somethings who continue to come to you tugging on that wallet going, can I please, 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 please? And so they had to go after you to get the money that they need. And so I'm sitting at home the other day, and right in front of my eyes, wouldn't you know, there's one of those ads blatantly targeted at me. And so I wanted to share that ad with you this morning so you get an understanding of what I'm talking about. Here it is. I get a big banner printed, and I saw the sign. Oh, did you? saw the sign to print big. All right, let's get you set up. So I didn't even know Staples still existed. Did you know that? Had no clue. Didn't even know it was still a store. And yet now because of this color scheme, the hair, the dance moves, and Ace of Base song, The Sign, that all screams 1990s. For some unknown reason, I feel an urgent need right now to print a large sign at Staples. I just, I just need one. Which just shows how crazy well advertising works. See, all these examples, though, bring us to the idea that there is something super important that we need to know when communicating. When you're communicating, when you are trying to talk to somebody, when you are trying to get somebody to buy into what you're doing, there's something that you have to understand, and that something is audience. Audience. You need to understand your audience. Audience is extremely important, and as we communicate, we have to make sure we know who we're communicating to in order to be effective. As we've talked through this series about evangelism and discipleship, as I venture into helping people find new life in Christ, and then I help them become more like Christ, I have to know who I am talking to and how to engage my audience in order to be effective, which takes skill, it takes tact, it takes intention, 
And yet we can all do it. And when we do it well, lives will be transformed. And so our focus today in our passage will help us understand how to engage our audience well because the individual in this passage, Paul, does it really, really well. So I'm going to encourage you to open with me this morning to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're going to study a good portion of this chapter today. Going to bounce around just a little bit. But we're going to be in one all the way to the very end. So if you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you one. There's some on the back table if you want a hard copy. If you're not in this space this morning, you're joining us online. You can download one on any smart device. You can do the same thing in this room. The TV up here that I have my notes on will also be in that app. If you go to events, go to extras, go to events, you'll find New Life Church. Go ahead and download those notes. Take them with you. I make an offer every Sunday and will continue to for as long as I possibly can because the hope is that we don't just read the Bible on Sundays, that we take it with us everywhere we go because as we talk about being transformed in this series, the Bible will transform your life. I guarantee it. So we're in Acts chapter 17 this morning, beginning in verse 1, which goes this way. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, They came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women, which I want to pause there for a second. This again affirms, as we've talked about in this series, I want to go back to it because it's important. Paul had a custom. Every city he went into, if there was a synagogue, he would go and he would talk about Jesus. Because the Jews at the time were looking for their Messiah. They were looking for their Savior to come. And Paul had found him. His name was Jesus. He said, the Jesus that we are, the Messiah that we are looking for is this man, Jesus. And so he'd go in and he would talk to them about it. And he would refer back to the scriptures to show them that this Jesus was the Messiah. He does this in all the cities he travels to. As we saw last week, there wasn't a synagogue. So he went and found those that were worshiping. He went and found the Jews that were by the river in the open air, and he spent time with this individual named Lydia. And so now he's here in Thessalonica, and he's found the temple, and he comes back. And it's been a fruitful time, a very fruitful time. It says, in fact, it says here that some of the Jews were persuaded as a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women, that the impact of what they were talking about was quite broad, which then causes a little bit of stir in this town. Other Jews take offense to this and they get upset and they go out into the square. They go into the local marketplace. They find some ruffians and they run Paul and Silas and his crew out of town. So Paul and Silas leave and they head to Berea. So if you jump down then into verse 10, it says this. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. See the pattern again? They went to the synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So Paul does it again. Goes into the synagogue. Let's the Jews know that the Messiah that you're looking for is this man named Jesus. Is fruitful again in Berea. Many of them believed. Many Jews came to know Jesus, as well as many prominent Greek women and many Greek men. And it says here specifically in this passage that the Jews in Berea were of better character than the Jews in Thessalonica. And so they embrace this message and they're excited and they're like, we want to hear more. We want to hear what it is that you have to say, so come back and many believe. The Jews, though, in Thessalonica hear about the fruitfulness of what's happening here in Berea, and so they come all the way down to Berea, which is about a 30-mile trek on foot, so they can cause problems where Paul is here. So they hear about what's going on. They're so incensed by it that this man would stir up trouble like he has been all over the world, as you see a little bit earlier in 17. He's causing problems everywhere because he's connecting the dots. He's speaking to his audience. He's helping them see what it is that they're looking for. And those that don't want to see it are getting upset, so they are causing problems. So a 30-mile trek from Thessalonica brings them to Berea, and they stir up trouble in Berea and try to get them to leave town. This time, though, only Paul leaves. Silas and Timothy stay behind, and Paul ends up heading to Athens. So to give us context, then, of what this has looked like, I want to pause here for a second, look again at this map. I shared this map last week. This is Paul's second missionary journey. 
We talked about his journey up through these spaces and got to hear last week as he'd come to Troas, he'd had his vision of the Macedonian man begging him to come here into Macedonia, which we know as modern day Greece. And so he stopped here. He has a vision. The vision sends him here. He's with a group of people, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, the author of Acts. And now he's headed from Philippi after talking to Lydia into Thessalonica. Thessalonica, he gets kicked out of, heads down to Berea. Berea, they kick him out of Berea as well too. And now he heads down into Athens. And something pretty incredible happens in Athens. And here's what's really cool about the world that we live in today. When we use the word Athens, Greece, it's the same place that Paul's talking about 2,000 years ago. The exact same place. The beauty of the Bible is it's historically accurate. So as we're talking about Athens, Greece, Athens, Greece still exists today. So when Paul's in Athens, he's in the Athens that we know of. Maybe changed a little bit. I think they've updated a few things. I've never been there, but I hear it's still pretty old. There's a lot of old stuff. Paul was there when it was new, which is pretty cool. And so we're talking about Paul's time there 2,000 years ago in the same place that we know of today. This is what then happens to Paul in Athens. Verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. Again, there he is. He's in the synagogue. He's been in the synagogue in Thessalonica, he's been in the synagogue in Berea, and now he's there again in Athens, which is going to be important because that's a specific audience he's speaking to. So keep that audience in your mind. As well then as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. Now all of a sudden we see a second audience come into view here. Paul's talking to those in the synagogue. They're looking for their Messiah. And now he's in Athens and his view changes a little bit, which is something that we need to see here. Because this passage shifts. It makes a shift into a second audience. He's been talking to those in the synagogue in all three cities so far, and now he addresses another audience, an audience in the marketplace, an audience in the public square. And so here in Athens, as he steps into the marketplace, he says this. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Which we have to see the dynamic here because Paul's in the synagogue telling people about Jesus as the Messiah. And they would have gone, oh yeah, totally get that. We're looking for our Messiah. We're going to wrestle through the scriptures because we're waiting for him to come. And now he steps into the marketplace and they're sitting there going, uh, what are you talking about? What's this babbler trying to say? Like he wasn't making any sense to them, which is exactly what it says, says here. That he was talking pretty much like a baby is what this phrase means. He was talking like a baby. Anybody understand what babies say? No, none of us. Unless you're like four, and then you can interpret for the two-year-old who's sitting there going, blah, 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 blah. And they point at things, and they say all sorts of stuff, and you're like, I don't get what you're saying. It's exactly what this phrase is referencing Paul as. He's like a baby. Blah, 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 blah. They had no idea what he was talking about. So then they're trying to figure it out. Seems like he's advocating for foreign gods. Why did it seem that way? Because Paul was saying the same thing in the synagogue he's saying in the marketplace. In the synagogue, they're wrestling through it. In the marketplace, they're going, I don't get it. And they're having to interpret it in a way through their lens, through their ears, so they could understand. It seems like he's advocating for foreign gods because he was talking about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting at the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we'd like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas, which is kind of funny because you could probably just put in parentheses there, they were pastors. Oh, wait. (laughs) All they did was sit around and talk about nothing and listen to the latest ideas? It's literally what I do for a living. They were thinkers, but they're sitting here wanting to know, which again is a dynamic that we see in Thessalonica. They run him out because they don't want to hear what he has to say. And now in Athens, they don't understand what he has to say, but they bring him in. And they're like, we want to hear you. We want to know what it is they have to say. Part of it's because culturally, that's all they did. They just listened to ideas. 
They didn't actually work. They just listened to new things. But they take him to the epicenter of their culture, the Areopagus, and they ask him to speak, which the Areopagus in this passage has a dual meaning. The dual meaning is that not only was it a place, but it was a council. And so here's the place. It's still there today. You can go visit it. Has anybody ever been there? A couple of you, yes. It's a place where they would gather. They'd sit here on this rock and they would talk about heady things. In fact, you can trace back some of the greatest thinkers of all time to this rock where they sat there and they thought about things that you and I would never think about. And they just talked about them. And there was a council of individuals, a council of very, very smart people that would sit there and they would discuss the newest ideas. And so they bring Paul there. And he presents this idea that he has that they've never heard before. And this is what Paul shares. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your object of, objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times and history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, as also a woman named Damaris and a number of others. This speech is so powerful that there's actually a plaque still to this day that sits there in front of the Areopagus. If you go to Greece, you can see this 2,000 years later left an imprint that we still see today, that Paul gets up there and he makes this speech and those that are listening are so impacted by it that many of them come to know and others wanted to hear, which is quite impressive because some say that speaking to this group would have been the equivalent today of speaking to the faculty at an Ivy League university, a completely different audience than Paul would have understood. So Paul chooses his words wisely, which is what we see him do all the way through this passage because Paul knew his audience. See, here in chapter 17, we see Paul speak to two different audiences, and he was successful in doing both. In fact, those audiences were the synagogue, which we talked about, Jews and God-fearing Greeks who somewhat understood what he was saying, and then the public square, the marketplace, the Areopagus, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who thought that he was a babbler, which is fascinating because Paul speaks to both these audiences. He speaks to both these groups, and he ends up being successful, which would be an encouragement to us because the one group he was comfortable with and the other group probably not so much. See, the one group he knew in the synagogue, he was one of them, which is where a lot of us tend to go. In fact, it was Paul's uh, habit to go into the synagogue. Why? Because he knew the people in the synagogue. He was one of them. He was trained in that way. He could speak their language and he could point them to the things that they had lived, their experience as a Jew, and he could train them in the scriptures because they'd known it. The other group, though, he was largely out of his element. He was not one of their scholars. It would have been a very daunting task to go before the Areopagus. And yet the reason he was successful is because there's a pattern within this passage a pattern in his speech to both groups that I think we can learn from to help us be successful when talking to different audiences, often ones that we're comfortable with and even those that we're not comfortable with. So what was the pattern that Paul followed? Well, in both conversations with his audience, he began by efforting towards this. He had to make it real. He needed to make his conversation about real things, 
which is extremely important when talking to an audience. One of the key aspects of communication is that it connects, that it becomes real, that I can relate to it. If I don't talk about a lived experience in a way that those around me can connect with, then I will have a hard time gaining a vested interest in what I am saying. Communication has to be connected to the world around us. If you've been here for an extended period of time, you'll see me do that at the beginning of every message. I try to connect something to what's happening in our world today. I did it just this morning. I played a Staples ad. It's real. Some of you have actually been in that store. I never have. Some of you know it still exists. But you watch TV, you know that ads exist. You know that marketing is for people in their 40s and 50s today because we have the resources to spend on their products. This is real. We get it. We understand it. We see it happening all around us, which is what Paul did with both his audiences. He made a connection up front with them because he engaged them with something real that was happening in their world at the time. In the synagogue, he did this. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead on three Sabbath days. What does that mean? Three weeks in a row, he went back. Three weeks in a row, he went in, and what did he do? He reasoned with them from the scriptures. And what did he talk about? He explained to them and proved to them the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. He did this because he knew his audience, and he knew exactly what they were talking about. This was real to them because at that time, they were having a major debate about resurrection. If those I know have died before me, will I ever see them again? If those that have gone that way, is there any hope that they'll come back? Is there any life after death? And Paul comes into the synagogue, and three weeks in a row, he looks at the scriptures and says, there is a Jesus, or there is a Messiah, his name is Jesus, and there is hope for the resurrection. How do we know that he was talking about this specifically in Thessalonica, where this happened in 17, 2, and 3? Because he wrote back to them again after he left, and he touched on this topic once more. We have the book today of 1 Thessalonians 4, or 1 Thessalonians, and in 4, 13 through 18, Paul addresses once again this topic of resurrection because it was on the forefront of their mind. He comes in, and he's talking about the resurrection. He's talking about Jesus, and they would have connected because they were asking some really big questions. So he talked about something that was real to them which he then did the same thing in the public square. People of Athens, I see that in every way you're religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your object of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. See, Paul had done his homework. What did he do? He walked around town. He walked around, he looked at everything, and he said, by my eyes, by my observation, I see that you are very religious. He paid close attention to what was going on and even spoke specifically to an altar that he had seen, the altar to the unknown God. See, we need to do that in our world today. We need to make sure we make things real. How do we make things real? We need to know the context by which we're speaking into. What's happening around us? What's going on? Paul knew very specifically what was happening in the synagogue because it was normal, it was natural for him. He'd grown up there. He'd been trained in it. He lived there. As you think about the spaces you've been in, think about the places that you've lived, the audiences that you speak to that are normal. It's really easy to make things real, right? Yeah, it's simple. Hey, we were at this place together. We saw this place together. We experienced this. Now try to do it to a context you don't quite understand. That's exactly what I've had to do moving here to Minnesota. You realize that Minnesota does things different, right? You guys know that? It's much different than many spots that I have lived on this planet. I've had to learn about all sorts of new things, new idols specifically. Things like lakes, didn't know about those. Lake homes, didn't know those existed. Boats, jet skis, snowmobiles, RVs, all sorts of things that in our context, as I've walked around this place, I've come to realize people worship. Minnesota, you are very religious. Very religious. I found idols to all sorts of different things. In fact, I found an unknown idol to me. I didn't know that this was even an idol, but I've seen people pray to it, and I've watched odd worship rituals that I've never seen before, like this one. Take a look at this video.
pretty <laughs> elaborate. And everybody knows what to do. And there's a pattern to it. And there's a culmination with this giant thing that makes everybody just get into a frenzy. And some of you in here right now are really uncomfortable. In fact, there's a good chance that you were wearing purple doing this in that video. And that's great. That sense of being uncomfortable is fantastic. Why? Because it's real. Because it's real. Because these are things that we have to examine in our lives that Paul, an outsider, looked at Athens and said there's idols everywhere, including idols that I don't understand. In fact, one to an unknown God. Paul made it real for his audience. Paul then, found, then he found a way to make it relatable. He found a way to make it relatable. So even though I make it real, I also have to make it relatable. How many people in here are not Vikings fans? Yeah, a good number of you. That doesn't relate to you at all. You're like, I don't get it. I live in this foreign land. That doesn't make any sense to me. See, the best advertising is done connecting something to individuals, connecting to my related lived experience so I can get it, which is the second key in connecting to our audience. It has to be relatable, which is where I think the Staples ad that I showed earlier starts to fall apart. It has a very low relatability factor. In fact, if you are younger than that demographic, you're sitting there going, I have no idea what that song is. You don't know that that song was extremely popular, and in 1994, it was number one on the Billboard charts. That Ace of Bass song, The Sign, was the number one song in 1994. If you are young, you have no idea. If you are older than that demographic, you're probably sitting there the same way going, I don't get it, Brett. That doesn't make any sense to me. In fact, up until this point, you're probably like, why did you even play that? That wasn't like that interesting. Exactly. And that's the point. Because there's a large demographic within here, young, old, maybe even in the middle, that could not relate to that ad, that could not relate to what was going on. Yet, if you fall right in the middle of that demographic and you totally understand what was going on, that ad is incredible. <laughs> because it's so relatable, because it's so relatable. What we have to make sure we do then is to be like Paul and make sure that we make it real and we make it relatable to our audiences, which again, Paul did really well. In the synagogue, he went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So Paul comes in. He's talking about something real, right? He's talking about the resurrection. Because they were talking about the resurrection. He then makes it relatable. And where does he go? He goes to the scriptures. He goes to the scriptures because they would have been searching the scriptures. The Macedonian Jews then couldn't believe that the Messiah would die and rise again because only a criminal would be crucified. It didn't make any sense. As they're talking about Jesus being the Messiah and then resurrection happening, there's no possible way that that would have happened because only criminals die on a cross. Messiah doesn't die on a cross. So what would Paul have done? He would have gone to the scriptures because they would have been in the scriptures. It would have been relatable. They would have understood it. I bet you he took them to Isaiah chapter 53. Because if you go into Isaiah chapter 53 and you put the lens of Christ over it and you read from the scriptures, which is what they would have had, it only makes sense that Jesus is the one they're talking about. That Jesus is the suffering servant. That Jesus is the Messiah. And if Jesus is the Messiah and he has risen from the dead and there is resurrection, then there's hope for every single one of us which Paul would have gone into the synagogue going, hey, give me the thing you can relate to. Give me your scriptures, and I will show you that the conversation we're having connects exactly, exactly to this man named Jesus. He then does the same thing in the square. He makes it relatable. From one man, he made all the nations. This is, again, Paul talking to the Areopagus. From one man, he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. 
See, Paul related what he was talking to them by speaking their language. He'd made it real by talking about all the different idols. And he said, you are religious. You are looking for things. You even have an idol to the unknown God. Well, I know this God. I know this God. And I will connect this God to something that relates to you. And so I left the footnotes in this passage for a purpose. If you have a study Bible, you probably have footnotes, and the footnotes are going to tell you something very important about this passage. How did Paul make it relatable to those in the square? Well, these footnotes give you insight into how he made it relatable. See, Paul, has done it re- Paul had done his research, and he quotes two of their leading figures at the time because that was the world they lived in, and that's what they could relate to. So what's interesting is Paul doesn't go to the scriptures with those in the square. He goes to their philosophers, and he quotes two of their philosophers and says, the God that you're looking for, the unknown God, the conversation that you're having, I know that God, and your philosophers are even talking about him. Your philosophers are speaking about him, and I have the answer to the questions that they're asking. It was genius. Because these people thought Paul was preaching about a new God. But but instead, Paul pointed to the fact that this wasn't a new God and said, this is the God that they had been looking for. This is the God that they had been talking about. This is the God that their philosophers were philosophizing about. And the God that they were looking for was right there with them. He was not hard to find. He was nearby. And Paul had the answer to who that God was. And that God was the maker and creator of the whole universe. See, how Paul speaks specifically then to those in the square that I think today can be especially useful for us. See, Paul had gone out of his way to make sure that he knew what was happening in Athens. He'd walked around, he'd seen their idols, he'd learned their cultures so he could speak to them, so he could connect with his audience. I believe then that we need to do the same thing today that we need to be like Paul and we need to be aware of what is happening in our world today so we can take what the world is talking about and connect it to what really matters, which is exactly what Paul did. He took their philosophers and said, what you're talking about actually connects back to the God of the universe. We need to do the same thing. I love looking at the world around us, finding connections to what the world is talking about back to the God that we know and love and serve. And so here's examples of things that I think we should pay attention to. Music, TV shows, hobbies, vacation destinations. I think maybe the most important is worldview. Spiritual versus non-spiritual. See, these are the things we're into today, right? One of the things that's really frustrating to me, and I try to limit this in our house, is I do not like walking around this world with everybody having earbuds in. It just bothers me. I don't know why. It's really annoying. So just know if you're around me and you're wearing an earbud for any purpose, I don't care what it is, I'm going to think you're annoying. (laughs) And it's going to bother me. And now there's some of you in this space going, ooh, I'm just going to wear earbuds around Brett. (laughs) Just so he'll be annoyed. Oh, I think it's annoying. (laughs) Our world is consuming all sorts of different things today. They're listening to all the philosophies, but they're doing it in a different way. They're not gathering on a rock, welcoming new ideas by new speakers who are coming in. Rather, they put their earbuds in and they're allowing it to be inundated, or they're allowing themselves to be inundated with ideas. The things that they are part of, the vacations that they go on, and specifically then their worldview. Do we know these things? As we look at the context around us, can we speak to these things? Are we aware of these things like Paul was so that we can be relatable to people? Which is a key component. Because Paul's strategy here is super interesting. With both audiences, he had the same message. And his message was the message of Jesus and the resurrection. And with one audience, he immediately went to the scriptures. And with another one, he didn't which is key for us to understand to reach our audiences, specifically in the square today, because in large part, we live in a world, much like Athens, where the scriptures mean nothing. Where when we speak like Paul was speaking, we sound like babblers. We sound like little babies. Because fewer and fewer people read the Bible today, and fewer and fewer people live by the authority of the Bible And the scriptures in our world today as an influential cultural tool 
for people in the pursuit of spirituality just doesn't make sense anymore. Paul understood that about Athens. They weren't getting what he said, so he had to find a way to connect it. So what did he do? He found what was going on in the world around them. And he said, hey, I've got this message for you, but I'm going to come about it a little bit of a different way. So what have we thought through strategically how we could do that? How could we be individuals that could find the spaces around us and grab the things the world is talking about and bring it back to Jesus? Because I believe that's a strategy that will be successful, just like it was for Paul here. As we preach Jesus, we need to find common ways, common cultural things to address and find a way to relate it back to Jesus. Because the beginning of the conversation is important. It has to be about Jesus and the resurrection. And the end of the conversation is important. It has to be about Jesus and the resurrection. But how we get there, in each one of our contexts, we have to figure out. And so as we think about making it relatable, we've got to think about how we can connect those at the beginning and at the end. What do we fill in the middle? Because that's exactly what Paul did. He began with Jesus, and he ended with Jesus every single time. Which brings us then to the third thing we need to focus on with our audiences. We must make it about Jesus. We must make it about Jesus. We have to make it real. We have to make it relatable. And then we must make it about Jesus. It's exactly what Paul did in 17.3 and 17.31. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. And then in the square, he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Who did he raise from the dead? God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus should be the beginning and the end goal of all of our conversations with as many people as possible as we are witnesses to what he has done. And I don't want to belabor this point, but I want to make sure we understand that the repetition of Jesus should get so monotonous that people expect it out of our mouths every time. Every time. We need to do it as often as we can, so much so that any time we open our mouths, we should get this response. Oh, this isn't going to be about Jesus, is it? All things are about Jesus, Homer. When you walk up to somebody, their response should be, oh, this isn't going to be about Jesus, is it? And we should be like, all things are about Jesus, everybody. All things. All things. Which it's meant to be funny. It's meant to be culturally relevant. But it's also meant to be true. All things should be about Jesus. See, Paul skillfully made his conversations with those around him in the synagogue and in the square about Jesus. As you read through that passage again, you will see that all the way through from beginning to end. What did he start with? Jesus and the resurrection. What did he end with? Jesus and the resurrection. We must do the same because ultimately all things are about Jesus. When we do that then, it brings us to our fourth point. We must let God do the rest. See, if we make it real and relatable and about Jesus, God is the one who will make it resonate. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. See, ultimately, we are not the ones that determine who this message will connect with and who it won't. God is the one who decides that. A couple things then to point out, connected to those that believe, the message of the gospel is for everybody. This continues to build off of that. In fact, as you notice in the recaps of all of those that come to believe, women are mentioned every single time now since we've talked to Lydia. Why? Because the doors have been blown off, all of the barriers. The gospel is for everybody. Everybody. Another important thing that we have to point out here is that not everybody will resonate with the message. Not everybody will resonate with the message. I think that's what's difficult for us. But Paul makes it very clear, or I should say Luke makes it very clear here, that some of the people and many of the people came to know. But the message of Jesus did not resonate for everybody. And that's difficult at times to get beyond. That we have to do our part, and God will do the rest. 
And just because we proclaim the name of Jesus, there will be people that that message doesn't connect with. In fact, if we go back to that Staples ad one more time, even though I am the target demographic of that commercial, and I get it, and I fully understand the 90s, and everything about that screams my era, that ad actually makes me want to run away from Staples as far as I possibly can. (laughs) Because I can't stand that song. I can't stand it. I couldn't stand it in the 90s. Once I got my license, every time that song would come on the radio, I turned the channel because it's a horrible song. In fact, still today, it pops up on the radio every so often, and people are like, oh, retro, throwback. I'm like, turn it, ah! I can't stand that song, and now, oddly, I can't stand Staples. I don't think I'll ever, ever go there. Which will be true of the message of Jesus Christ. That as we proclaim the name of Jesus, some people it will really resonate with, and others will not be able to stand it. And in so doing then, the reality of what God has called us to is that there might be people in this world that won't be able to stand you either. Yet God has called us to break down those barriers and to proclaim the name of Jesus in everything that we do because there's nothing more important than knowing him. Nothing. And so we must be people that do it. Our challenge then in this world as we share the message of the gospel as witnesses is this. We must make it real. We must make it relatable. We must make it about Jesus. And then ultimately God will make it resonate. So this week then, think through these things in your conversations with all of your audiences. You're going to talk to some people you're really comfortable with. You're going to talk to some people you're not. And yet this pattern will hold true. How can we make it real? What is the world talking about? How can we make it relatable? What's going on in their space? How can we make it about Jesus? How can we begin and end there? And ultimately, we've got to give it away, and God will make it resonate. And yet, when we do, lives will be transformed. So this week, in your conversations, knowing your audience, strive to incorporate these things, leaving the rest up to God. And as he makes it resonate, as he sees fits, then ultimately, lives will be transformed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to wrestle with your word and to dig into the scriptures that are comfortable for many of us in here, and yet maybe not so in the world around us, and yet it's a message that everyone needs. And so I pray today, Lord, that as we leave this space, that we will be people that will understand our audience, that we will be focused on the world around us, and that we will utter your name over and over and over and over again, to the point where people look at us going, oh, this isn't going to be about Jesus, is it? And the answer will be, yes, it is. And Lord, we know that for some, it will be a sweet-smelling aroma. And for others, we will smell like death. And so I pray, Lord, that you will be with us as we go out, because ultimately the challenge before us is that this world needs you so desperately. So may we be a people that does that, like Paul, regardless of the outcome that we continue to move forward as we went from city to city to city. In some places, they welcomed him. In other places, they kicked him out. Lord, may that be true of us, that in this world, we will be like you, and that we will continue to push forward your message in spaces where sometimes it's received and sometimes it's not. Lord, we thank you for this challenge. We praise you for this opportunity, and we pray that ultimately when we go out, it's about you because you are the King of kings, Lord of lords, and may we glorify you in all we do. Jesus, it's in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing one last song before we take off today. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word 
from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. have it pretty easy in my life to make it about Jesus right from the start. People ask me what I do for a living, and immediately I say I'm a pastor, and they're like, oh, this is going to be about Jesus, huh? Yes! So what's your in? How do you begin the conversation? Here's what's cool. Over the last couple weeks, I've had a chance to get to know a number of individuals. I've been taking my son bowling. There's this kids bowl free program in Minnesota. We've absolutely loved it. One of the first conversations I had with a gentleman, he asked what I do for a living, and I said, oh, I'm a pastor. He said, oh, and he kind of turned away. Well, over the last number of weeks, I've gotten to know him. And just yesterday, he invited me to be a part of a bowling league with him. Which, I, yeah, no, there's no, no, you don't need to applaud. I was telling my wife, like, I'm really excited about this, which is not something I thought I'd ever say in my life, that I'm excited to be a part of a bowling league. <laughs> but, like, I literally couldn't sleep last night because I was thinking about being invited to be in a bowling league. It was so cool. <laughs> And yet more than that, it's an open door into who knows what. Hang out with people that God has put in front of me because of an opportunity I had to go be with my son. Beginning with a conversation, hey, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. And so what about this week for you? As you go into these spaces, how do you start that conversation? And who knows, maybe you too will join a bowling league. (laughs) 
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for the doors that you open, the opportunities you give us. And so I pray this week that you do that for every single person in this space. That you will give us opportunities to start with you and to end with you. In the middle, find connections along the way, whether it be the scriptures or philosophers or bowling or other things, Lord, that we may never have thought of in our lives that you then will give us a passion for as ultimately we have a purpose in this life to proclaim you as we love you and love others. So Lord, open doors all over Minnesota, open doors all over the United States, open doors all over the world for believers everywhere to be given the opportunity to step into the space that you have designed for us to proclaim your name to the ends of the earth. I pray, Lord, that we do it well, that we connect with our audience, that we make it real, that we make it relatable, that we make it about you. And ultimately, God, you will make it, make it resonate and that we will live in a way that is different. So when the world sees us, they see you through us. We thank you. We praise you. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. You guys have a great week. See you next weekend.